Hello, I'm David Mandy, uh, president of O&M Partners. I want to welcome everyone today to the Trilogy, Trilogy Metals Town Hall call. Um, Trilogy trades on the New York Stock Exchange, the American, under the symbol TMQ, and they also is trades at TN, TMQ um, on the TSX. Uh, for those of you who are new to these broadcasts, it's brought to you by O&M Partners. We're here in New York, a marketing communications company. Um, for 20 years, we've, uh, um, you know, our, our mission has been to help in, uh, non-deal investors, uh, you know, make better informed uh, decisions. Um, so um, we hope this call, um, today's event, um, will make you want to participate in future uh, events. Um, we want to answer everyone's calls today. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to you go to the go to webinar the uh, the question plane or you uh, you can email us um we will only have time for a certain amount of questions but be be assured we will get back to you um our introductory speaker before we turn to our host is the mercenary geologist Mickey Fulp uh, Mickey's a well-known highly respected throughout the mining industry uh an exploration community for his work as 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 an analyst as a writer as a speaker He's been in the business for 35 years, um, um, searching for economic deposits in all metals, industrial metals, base, precious. Um, he's been all over the world, um, uh, North and South America, Europe, Asia. Um, and it's um, he's a really, uh, it helps advance the cause of the mining industry. So it's a real pleasure to have Mickey with us today. We'll turn the call over to Mickey. Thanks for the introduction, David. Mickey Fulp, mercenarygeologist.com website, Twitter at mercenarygeo, email contact at mercenarygeologist.com. I'm not a certified financial advisor, so anything I say here today cannot be construed as investment advice uh, or uh, promotion of any long or short buy or sell financial instrument. This is part two on the supply demand fundamentals of copper. In part one, we talked about the short-term uh, fundamentals. Today, we're gonna talk about the mid and long-term fundamentals, which are much clearer than what's going on in the short-term right now with the, uh, with the Wuhan flu and, and the turmoil it's introduced to the world's economic health. So we're gonna start with world mine production. And so this is over the last 119 years. And you can see uh, time and time, year after year, with a couple of uh, uh, perturbations during depressions or wars, that the copper demand has increased steadily uh, our, uh, through mine production. Uh, we start at about a half a million tons in 1900. And 2018, we we're up to 21 million tons of copper. Uh, you also see the importance of uh, uh, copper oxide, XEW copper, has started coming in uh, in the uh, 1970s, and it has increased about 4 million tons a year. Uh, so that's somewhere uh, on the order of 20% of the copper market. Copper mine by country, and we all know that Chile is the world's largest copper producer, but it is losing market share uh, uh, significantly, and it's, it's accelerating. Peru's come on over the last few years. We expect that to continue, uh, and China uh, increasing, uh, but, uh, but they've probably reached about their limit. They have no really... Uh, big mines, lots of small mines. And the U.S. is composed about 6 to 7 percent of copper production uh, for well over the last decade. Uh, we should also look at Congo, uh, arguably, uh, well, no doubt the world's best copper and cobalt deposits, but uh, extreme geopolitical risk as, uh, as also occurs in Zambia, places like Indonesia, uh, Kazakhstan, those are not the most stable governments in the world. Uh, here's refined copper production. This is essentially 
demand uh, uh, with the exception of recycling. Uh, uh, so if we look at uh, from 1960 to 2018, uh, refined copper production. Once again, you see the contribution of secondary copper, that would be uh, uh, scrap, and also the increased contribution of SXEW copper oxide production. And once again, that copper oxide production has stabilized at about 20% of the market over the last decade or so. And that becomes really important when we look at where our future copper supplies are going to come from. So I'm a bit of a copper permeable, and these are the reasons. There are 85 million more humans on the planet every year. That's something about 230,000 people per day. Uh, yet 25% of those people still live without electricity. They can't turn on a light switch. They go to bed when it gets dark and they get up when it gets light. And most of those people without electricity are in Eastern Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And certainly in Eastern Asia with urbanization, lots of people, rural people moving the cities. And, uh, and it is not quite as pronounced in Sub-Saharan Africa, but there are projections that in 2100, Lagos in Nigeria will be the world's largest city with 100 million people. Uh, so you can't generate electricity. Well, let's put it this way. You cannot transmit and transform electricity without copper. So we saw in our uh, world mine charts uh, from 1900, the annualized demand for copper is uh, has been 3.2% year after year since 1900. And here's the real problem, uh, discovery of new copper de uh, deposits are much less than our current increase in copper demand on a yearly basis. So another way to look at this would be look at world population growth and copper consumption. And we've done that for uh, what, 69 years uh, from 1950 to 2018, and in the Hatchard, light blue is world population growth. So when I was born, the world population about three million people. Uh, now we're at 7.4, 7.5 billion people. Uh, and so arguably uh, 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 that's the reason that copper consumption goes up. But us also look at the per capita consumption of copper on an annual basis. When I was born, the, the copper consumption per person was about a kilogram and a half per year. Uh, fast forward to 2018, that is now up to three and a quarter kilogram. Two kilograms per person more uh, on the planet, more copper used than it was in uh, in the early 1950s. So there's your demand. And this kind of puts it in perspective for those in the know about the copper business. This is the new copper required per year. This is Bingham Canyon outside of Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, the first large open pit copper mine uh, ever to exist. It it became uh, an open pit operation in 1908. It started production and has been in production continuously since 1880. Uh, so let's do the math. Uh, and that's 140 years now in continuous copper production. Uh, in its lifetime, it has produced right around 21 million tons of copper. And what's our use? 21 million tons of copper per year. So we've got to find one of these. We've got to find a Bingham Canyon every year. And it's getting increasingly difficult to do that. Where will the new copper come from to meet this uh, continuous demand? Well, if you look, North and South America 
although uh, perspective for copper are mature provinces. You don't find copper deposits sticking out of the ground in, in these venues. Um, so uh, if you look at the DRC, the Congo, Eastern Asia, uh, the Philippines, for example, Southwest Pacific, Indonesia, all geopolitically untenable, in my opinion, uh, 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 places to go and explore for copper. Uh, one of the world's largest discovered copper deposits drilled out is in Pakistan. It's equivocal if it will ever be in production, most likely not in my lifetime, and most likely not in your children's lifetimes. Australia, once again, a mature and covered terrain. It has potential uh, and then, uh, but difficult exploration. And finally, uh, kind of goes back to my second point, second and third world resource nationalism. I already mentioned Pakistan with a world-class deposit. Uh, we've made some discoveries in other parts of the world. There's a really good deposit and in the Andes of Argentina, uh, copper molly deposit, uh, uh, hung up in geopolitical intrigue in a country that, uh, at the end of World War I, uh, Argentina was had the fifth highest GDP in the world, and you see where they sit now. Uh, so where will all this copper come from? Uh, copper oxides, uh, limited upside there. We're already at about uh, 4 million tons a year. We've said about that much for the last a decade or so, limited ability to find giant copper deposit. And this is really what drives the market because these are surficial deposits. Uh, uh, they're, they're oxidized from the sulfide. And so the ability for those to contribute much more is equivocal at best. We certainly are mining lower grades. We're gonna have to mine lower and lower grades. That's kind of the history of mankind. We go deeper and we mine lower grades. Uh, exploration, we are developing new techniques uh, to explore uh, for buried deposits and at deeper levels. There's a wonderful discovery in, uh, in Arizona resolution about 600 meters deep, a world-class copper deposit. Uh, there has been another recent discovery in the last five years in Serbia, high-grade deep copper deposit. In my opinion, the solution to this quandary, and really it is, is where the copper will come from. It's gonna come through good old, uh, American-driven engineering technology and innovation. Uh, we all know about the Malthusians, John Malthus and the Club of Rome and, and uh, uh, Ehrlich and all these, Paul Ehrlich and all these uh, people that said the world is going to end in the 70s because we run out of natural resources by year 2000. That doesn't happen. I'm a cornucopian who thinks that Human beings will find what they need uh, when they need it and will develop the technology to, uh, to uh, supply it to uh, mankind. Um, finally, uh, when you're considering speculating in a mining company, I would encourage you to always remember what Mark Twain said in the Comstock load. Uh, he was a journalist there, essentially a newsletter writer from 1861 to 1864. He said, a mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing beside it. I don't think I'm a liar, but I am standing there with uh, uh, next to a hole in the ground with some Picaneros in, in Northern Chile uh, about 10 years ago. Um, we had great hopes for that mine. It got tucked. Uh, tied up with uh, legal and, and ownership issues, and it sits undeveloped today. Uh, I run a free subscription newsletter. You can sign up, get my stock picks immediately uh, with only a name and an email address. You can fake your name. You got to give us a working email address. Uh, once again, uh, send me an email. I answer always unless you are a troll. 
mercenarygeologist.com. We got about 7,400 subscribers. The price is right, it's free. And 51,200 Twitter followers at Mercenary Geo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mickey. I'm always learning from you. Again, Mickey Fulp, the mercenary geologist. Now we're gonna to turn to our host, uh, James Gowans. Uh, Jim is currently the interim president and chief executive officer of uh, Trilogy Metals. Uh, he was previously the president and CEO and director of Arizona Mining uh, from January, 2016 until it was purchased by South 32 in August, 2018. Um, Jim has a very deep very background in mining and has had a lot of success. Um, just to give a little sense of that, for, for, he was a senior advisor, he had senior roles at Barrick Gold Corporation. And I like to think that, he, I think he started at the Placer Dome, which uh, uh, he gets extra points from me for that. Um, he's, Jim is also here today to introduce the newly elected um, uh, president and CEO, uh, Tony. A Giardini. So um, we'll be doing that at some point. Um, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, actually, I had about almost 20 years with Chemical Tech before I switched over to Placer Dome. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I thought uh, Jim, we were going to give a presentation update, but I thought before we do that, uh, we have on the line uh, our new uh, CEO, uh, Tony Giardini. Tony and I actually worked together for uh, almost 10 years uh, at Blaster. We were executives at Blaster. Tony, if you're on the line, uh, have you got a minute uh, to say a few words? Yeah, I do, and uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I, I think the presentation on the, the copper industry that we had at the beginning was quite insightful and I think those themes about you know where is the copper going to come from and just declining grades and copper consumption in general are very relevant to uh, Trilogy and having just uh, been in the copper space working in the DRC uh, with Ivanhoe you know I can certainly shed light on um, the, the challenges that you have working in uh, different jurisdictions and that's not to say that uh, uh, that that uh, uh, mining in general is uh, is 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 easy to deal with, regardless of where you work. But I think uh, Trilogy is in a very good position, uh, having a high grade deposit in Alaska, uh, in a mining friendly jurisdiction. And I think we're in a very good position. And I'm very excited to be taking over uh, the role uh, from Jim, who is there on an interim basis. But really. Uh, having taken it over from Rick Van Neuenhuis, who uh, uh, was the uh, president and CEO of the company when it was spun out of Nova Gold. And I've been on the board since that time. So um, I'm very excited about this opportunity and uh, I look forward to uh, getting to know uh, investors and shareholders in the company as we go forward. Great, thanks, Tony. Yeah, it's good to have you on board as a, as a CEO. All right, uh, if, if uh, no other things, I would like to go on to presentation. I'll just put it on the view. Uh, and we're just gonna bring up, uh, uh, give everybody an update. There's a few things that have happened other than uh, with Tony coming on. Uh, before I go on to that, just uh, to warn everybody that uh, we're making some uh, forward-looking statements. Um, so there it is. You've heard a lot from uh, Mickey on, on the uh, copper demand, and I think that's going to continue to go up. Uh, and, you know, as we get as we get start to develop, forget about the, the COVID-19, uh, I think there's a, a great uh, market as we start to electrify the, the world and start to move into the uh, electric vehicles. The demand for copper actually is going to go in increasing over the numbers that you saw historically from from Mickey. Well, we have at Ambler we have a, a good uh, amount of the Ambler Mining District in in Northwest Alaska. It was up uh, just east of where uh, where I was involved in the in the late eight, mid to late eighties, uh, early nineties uh, when I was building. Red Dog and operating Red Dog uh, mine, which is now a tech uh, tech operation. 
But we have a couple deposits up there and we're focusing in on two projects. Uh, the, uh, the Arctic uh, deposit, which is an open pit, uh, runs about 43 million tons, uh, grading over 2% copper, which is pretty fantastic, has uh, significant amounts of zinc and uh, also significant amounts of uh, the precious metals, gold and silver. So it has on our pre-feasibility study, uh, we had uh, over a, almost a one and a half billion uh, and a great 33% uh, IRR. We also have the Bornite deposit, uh, which was uh, a known deposit when I was working up in Northwest Alaska. Uh, it's been developed and it contains about 6 billion pounds of copper and uh, 77 million pounds of cobalt. So it's a very uh, prospective uh, deposit as well. We said, uh, here's uh, uh, Tony. Uh, you could ask some questions about him later, but he has lots of experience, been involved in uh, Trilogy uh, and also as an executive with Kinross, uh, uh, oversaw the Fort Knox uh, near Fairbanks. And so he's got a good last experience as well. I think uh, everybody's uh, seen our shareholders. Uh, we're well funded. Uh, we have no cash uh, and we have uh, quite a bit of, we have, or no debt, sorry. We have quite a bit of cash actually in, in Trilogy Metals, but we also have uh, uh, about half of 145 million in the Ambler Metals uh, joint venture that we've set up with uh, South 32, which I'll talk about before. You could see the major shareholders, uh, Electrum being our largest one. Uh, South 32 has about just over 10%. Pulse and Salts around 10 ball posts as well. So that's a, and we have uh, over 3% in management. Just want to talk about our, our three partnerships. Uh, the first one is our partnership with South 32, uh, which we were able to uh, bring over the line uh, in, uh, in mid-December, we formed the Ambler Metals, uh, which is a, a JV, private JV set up to basically develop the deposits in the Ambler Mining District. Um, and for that, they, got, they threw in $145 million uh, to give us the funding to, to, to do that. This is the area of interest. You can see the uh, this is the Ambler Mining District uh, running along here on the s uh, southern flanks of the, the Brooks Range uh, with the Arctic deposit right here and the Boronite deposit. Uh, the Boronite is actually uh, located on uh, Nana land. So they the Nana Native uh, Organization, which uh, I worked with for about six years with uh, Red Dog. They're a great group. Um, they've thrown in the Boronite uh, in exchange for a possibility of either earning in or they get a net profits interest uh, from uh, their uh, their earnings on this on our deposits as a as a partner. You can see there's other deposits in there, and this belt itself is about uh, almost uh, 70 miles long, or about 100 kilometers. So it's very prospective, and it's been there a long time. Nana, as, I, as we talked about, is our other, what we call a partnership. Uh, they're well known and they work in the area up in, here's where we are in the Amber District. Red Dog Mine being up in the northwest corner of uh, the northwest Arctic Borough region. Uh, and here's their, uh, their communities. And there's about 14, 15,000 Inupat uh, shareholders uh, that are from that region. And the third one is uh, obviously the uh, we need infrastructure uh, and the uh, state of Alaska uh, through the uh, Alaska Industrial Development and Export Agency Authority, uh, which was uh, involved in uh, actually developing the, the Red Dog uh, port and road facilities. And that's you can see the that's the uh, the Red Dog road there at the bottom end. So they've uh, proposed to uh, to run uh, a road from the Dalton Highway into the into the Amber Mining Districts, which would facilitate the uh, uh, development of those uh, all those deposits in that region. 
there's where you could see it, the road going from the Northwest area, the Amber Mining District out to the Dalton Highway. Uh, it's concentrates that were produced would be come down, down there and then down to Fairbanks, put on the Alaska uh, Railroad, which is a highly underutilized uh, infrastructure in Alaska, and then out to an ice-free port. Uh, this is a very uh, attractive, this is one of the reasons why I, when I was asked to go on the board, I was excited about that. Having built Red Dog Mine, uh, you know, we built a 50-mile road out to the port. Unfortunately, we we're still above the, uh, the Bering Strait, which is way down here, and we're, you still got frozen uh, ocean for about uh, four months of the year. So, that's a big disadvantage. You had to have about a year storage for the concentrates. What the magic on this project is being able to take the concentrates out through the Ambiat uh, road, out onto the railroad and out to an ice free port. So that's what makes this exciting. And there's uh, the picture of the port at Anchorage. And again, it only operates about three days a week because it's highly underutilized as well uh, now that things have cooled down on the north slope. Our, our concentrates will be running into the ships uh, and we'll be, they'll all be containerized uh, so there'll be no lossage, uh, which is very environmentally friendly uh, and then dumped into the bulk carriers uh, at Anchorage. Just want to talk about the road permitting because uh, this is one of the ones that's uh, critical right now, the final EIS was put in on uh, at the end of uh, March, March 26th, 27th, actually was when it went in. Uh, that's very exciting because that, that means within about uh, 30 to 45 days, uh, we'll get the uh, record of decision, which is basically the allowing the road to go ahead uh, with the criteria by which they hold design it. I think the, getting that in uh, at the end of April or early May, which is the anticipated time, time frame, this is a priority for the Secretary of the Interior in, uh, in the United States. Um, and then that basically uh, sets in motion uh, the development of these projects. This gives you an idea where it's located. It starts at the Dalton Highway. Uh, which is the road the highway going up to the North Slope Borough, and it runs basically it runs along the foothills of uh, the south side of the Brooks Range into the Ambler Mining District, up and uh, located uh, just north of the, the three Nana uh, communities here: Shungnak, Kobuk, and, and Ambler. We did look at different alternatives, uh, but this is the one that uh, was the chosen. It's the shortest route and the most uh, uh, minimal in terms of environmental uh, challenges. This gives you an idea of some of the opportunities here. Uh, this is a, a close-up of the Ambler uh, mining. This is the VMS belt on this side and then we got the uh, carbonate replacement deposits on the south side of the valley the, with the boronite and associated the other own uh, prospects around that area. The Arctic is the first one that we would be, we want to uh, start looking at. This is the uh, reserves, again, 43 million tons, an open pit uh, of about two to a third percent copper. I don't think there are very many uh, um, deposits, uh, copper deposits, which have that kind of grade. Uh, it has about a 12-year life, uh, uh, life on that. You can see it in cross-section. You can see the uh, tabular type deposits in there and an open pit. It's very, uh, very, very well suited to our open pit development. Our pre-feasibility study, and we're actually in the process of doing uh, this trilogy metals, doing a feasibility study, which will be uh, hopefully completed by the end of uh, H1 but this one shows the economics. <clears throat> Initial capital, just under 8 million, 8 billion, uh, 800 million rather, uh, a total of about a billion dollars uh, over the period of its uh, duration, uh, producing after taxes about uh, in excess of $1.4 billion. 
So that's a pretty good payback. But I thought we'd just put this one in. Uh, you can see the this uh, the robust economics. Uh, you can a lot of these uh, prospects are all based on a lot lower uh, grades, uh, and we're quite quite far up on the uh, on the on the grade and the profitability index. So that's very exciting. This just shows you kind of our. Uh, pounds of copper equivalent um, and where we sit in so we we know that we can get down to just uh, about two dollar copper and still be making money if we brought this into production so that's uh, very exciting <clears throat> i wanted to talk about the concentrates we have a copper concentrate and a zinc concentrates they're very clean concentrates good recoveries uh, the copper concentrate uh, contains precious metals predominantly uh, silver uh, Zinc concentrates nice and clean, almost a 60% grade, uh, so no pen, no significant penalties in that. And the precious metals concentrate, which is lead concentrate as a carrier, but it uh, runs uh, very high amounts of uh, silver. You can see almost 70 ounces per ton, and uh, gold, which is over an ounce. So that's a <coughs> that's a particularly good concentrate. And you can see that uh, that produces over 12%. Uh, and with this is at prices that were are far smaller than what you see right now, and uh, what's happening in the in the market uh, currently. Here's a picture of our uh, a deposit uh, on the on the uh, the east side of this valley, um, and there's where the pit. And we're looking at putting a tailings and uh, waste disposal system up the head end of the valley very very straightforward uh, nothing uh, nothing on un undue difficulty with this uh, development and we would start the permitting uh, in 2020 uh, later this year as we develop once we finish our feasibility study we also have uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work in the summertime here if uh, depending on what's happening with the COVID uh, uh, issues but we anticipate being able to get out and do some drilling on the on the Arctic and a couple of other targets in this area. There's uh, the known deposits. The other one that's exciting that we're looking at is the sunshine. Uh, we've done some work on that, uh, particularly last year, and we're going to be we anticipate dr do some more drilling on that uh, uh, in this coming next couple of years. And this is a result of uh, we did a. a uh, EM flyover last year and uh, the whole VMS belt lit up. You can see some of the exciting areas, uh, both in the areas in the uh, some of the deposits that we uh, had previously had historic drilling on or others that had historic drilling on, um, but also in other new areas. There's the Arctic deposit. You can see the, the size of that with the uh, anomaly. Uh, and over even over here, this at the center of the universe, so named. Uh, it's got an anomaly that shows up almost as well, and we don't have any real uh, work on that. Here's the sunshine deposit where we've been drilling near the outcrop, and the anomaly actually is shows that there's a looks a lot like more prospectivity uh, under the the mountains to the, just to the west of that. So we will be doing some more work on that over the next couple of years. The one big advantage of uh, the sunshine uh, and other VMS belt deposits, they're metallurgically uh, or mineralogy very similar to the Arctic deposit. So they would be additional feed to the to the process plants that was uh, that's built for the development of the Arctic deposit. So that's pretty exciting. Here's some other drilling results on sunshine. You can see very similar results uh, containing copper. Uh, zinc, uh, so again, the lead with containing a lot of the silver and gold values in the uh, in that deposit. So the VMS uh, district uh, looks very good. You can see lots uh, lots of prospectivity uh, and huge potential uh, for that. 
uh, just to, here's the uh, expiration upside. Uh, we will be doing some work on the Boronite uh, and Arctic, and then we will be doing some more work on Sunshine and and the uh, uh, center of the universe. Picture of our camp, nice and neat. Uh, actually, the old historic head frame from the, the days when Kennecott was doing expiration up in there. This is a bore night uh, where we did some drilling this past summer up there uh, and we're get, picking up some more down dip extension. Uh, so this deposit, we're gonna do some more uh, geology on uh, over the next year to take all the interpretation we've had and the geochemistry, uh, but it looks like it would have a small starter pit and then we uh, decline down to, to go after the, uh, the uh, deposits under under the, the ground there. Just some uh, some of the pickup of some of the heat, you can see some of the, uh, looks like great prospectivity uh, uh, down dip. Uh, this is the proposed pit area. So just to give you the up catalyst, uh, I want to talk about the AMDEP, which is the Ambler Mining District uh, access uh, road. We've had, we're anticipating seeing, getting the record of decision uh, happening uh, in, the, in the next couple of weeks, uh, and we would complete our feasibility study in H1. Uh, and we, we would actually start to do the summer program again. Uh, we do a lot more infill drilling at the Arctic, as well as looking at the other prospect, uh, highly prospective targets uh, in the, in the uh, VMS belt. Uh, center of the universe and, and sunshine would be the two of those and we would start uh, permitting the arctic as we start to to move into doing some more engineering and uh, and work on that and that's pretty much uh, a summary of where we are we, you can see this uh, on this the funding requirements we're well funded right through to getting the permitting done and the infill drilling and we would probably have enough money to do the uh, get well into the detailed engineering, and also maybe to, to participate in uh, to accelerate the development of the Ambler uh, access roads. Uh, we may be working with uh, with the uh, government or ADA uh, to, to contribute some money up front on that to be able to do that. At, Red Dog, what was originally set up with ADA is that uh, they funded uh, completely and then they got a, a tolling charge back on the concentrates going down the road. We would be looking at a similar uh, thing, more or less, uh, and that uh, paid back the money uh, several times over the 30, 40 years that uh, Red Dog would be running. Oh, thank you. That's our that's our update. So exciting news! Uh, Tony stepping in as as uh, our uh, new CEO coming on uh, just at the start of our, our uh, expiration program. We've put off the expiration program a little bit uh, to, just because of the of the COVID uh, issues. Uh, uh, we were originally going in in late March to, to to clean up the snow around the camp. We've had the camp inspected over the last couple of weeks. There is some snow in there, so we will be working. We will, when we get an opportunity to, uh, and things settle down with the COVID, we would go in there, clean the camp up, and then start our program. And that's it. Thank you, Jim. Real pleasure. We're going to turn to Q&A. I wanted to uh, also introduce Pat Donnelly, um, who's your point person at uh, Trilogy. Pat's VP, uh, Corporate Communications and Development. Uh, we've worked with Pat in the past. He's uh, got a great career. Um, project geologist for 25 years. Uh, worked as a mining analyst on, on the Canadian securities business. Um, he was also uh, most recently president of First Mining Gold Corp. Um, um, where he played a key uh, role, so it's great to have Pat on the call with us. We're going to start our. We're going to start with our questions. We'll, let's start with Chesley Martin. Chesley. Hey, thank you, David. Uh, Jim, uh, great presentation. Uh, you mentioned earlier a 12-year mine life, and I guess that's 
based on what you know you have now, I, I would think that some of these um, prospects uh, in the immediate area would extend that well beyond uh, any of our lives. Um, it's a it's a it's uh, a resource rich area. Um, could could you give us just a bit of um, of color on the uh, timeline with regard to the road? We know that you're just maybe a month or so away from uh, from that decision, but um, with appeals process and the eventual um, um, funding of that, the, the selling of the bonds and the building of the road, how long would that probably take altogether? Uh, we've got actually, we've uh, received several schedules from, uh, from Ada on that. Uh, the, the most recent one we're looking at is, uh, you know, once the record decision gets, uh, we get that in, call it uh, early May. <clears throat> we would uh, be working with Ada to try and accelerate the uh, the uh, detailed engineering. There's a couple things that have to happen over the next year. You, you actually can't do any construction on it until the winter time. But we would uh, we have to do a detailed uh, survey of the of the designated route, uh, and that would happen this summer. We got to do a little bit more field work, particularly. Uh, uh, at the first 50 miles uh, and uh, it's about nine to ten months of detailed engineering uh, that has to be done so we would we would kind of kick that off at uh, the start of h2 uh, and uh, work with ada to get that going and it, it would probably uh, not see any construction until about a year a year out in the uh, next uh, next december or thereabouts it would probably take about three, three, four years uh, to build this. So it wouldn't be a critical element as long as we stay to that schedule in terms of the development of the Arctic deposit. And that's a current. That's a that's a current schedule we're looking at. Uh, they've. We just need a Pioneer Road to get in our major equipment, uh, and the road would be designed as a private single road uh, with pullouts uh, for initial initial uh, development of the of the Arctic deposit. So would you order your long lead items like halfway through that road process? Yeah, we still have to do the, you know, find a feasibility study and do a lot more infill drilling to get to uh, meet the the uh, the development criteria for South 32. And that also gives us an opportunity to get more core in to do uh, pilot plant testing just to confirm uh, our metallurgical test work. Uh, and we've been doing that over the next two or three years while we're doing, while we're during, uh, concurrent with the uh, permitting process. That's great. Well, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Thanks, Chesley. We'll turn to Doug Wild. Doug? Um, I, this is fascinating. You have issues with getting the road permitted. How about the projects itself? How long do you think that's really going to take? And after some of the problems some other people have had up there, do you anticipate any problems? We actually don't anticipate uh, too many problems. Uh, obviously, there's a uh, you know uh, uh, Northern Dynasty is going through a permitting uh, you know right now on, on their prospect uh, as well as Donland Creek. When you actually look at uh, uh, Arctic, <clears throat> we're, our footprint is less than 150 acres. We don't have uh, uh, we don't have any creeks that have uh, uh, fish in them in, in the area that we're we're looking at the development of that because there's waterfalls uh, uh, d uh, downstream of where our creeks are. So we actually don't anticipate being that much uh, uh, permitting issues. Uh, mainly because of the, uh, the the small footprint of uh, of our uh, our deposit. Okay, that's that's very interesting. I noticed you have you know you're going to do an open pit. Have they looked at going in sideways, so to speak, to an attic to to get to the ore you want to mine rather than cut off a six to one uh, ratio? No, we 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 actually did. There was some initially some uh, trade-off studies done on uh, developing it up uh, for uh, an underground deposit, uh, but it it makes more sense to 
an open pit mine uh, producing about 2.3% copper is a pretty nice uh, open pit mine. It's relatively a small, very small footprint. And uh, we do also have some inferred resources uh, in the uh, in the footwall uh, of the deposit, uh, which we you could always run a decline off the uh, the pit and go after those at a later date. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Doug. We're going to turn to Heinz Toma. Heinz, question today for Jim? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jim, for the, the update. How do you get to the, the projects at the moment? Can you drive or do you fly in? Uh, we have an airport uh, that's located near the Bornite. Uh, uh, we, we would fly in uh, there and then there's uh, roads and uh, local roads that uh, get in. So we have a we have a major airport. It's it's uh, it can take a herc, uh, so we can move in big equipment in there as well. So the timeline, if everything works out with the uh, the permits and the the road construction, when would uh, the production possibly uh, kick in? Twenty twenty six or something? Yeah, it'd be about 26. So if you figure uh, the worst case scenario, about uh, three years of permitting and then a, and then three year uh, of building. So you're looking at about six years from now. So 26, 25, 26. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Hans. I will turn to Howie Flanker. Howie, question today? Yeah, I have uh, three questions. First, can you please tell me how much copper is used in solar power or solar cells uh not not so much in solar in the solar panels themselves uh, but in the hook, hook of uh you know the all the um i call it the the network that pulls from the cells into the into the general power that's all copper so there's quite a bit of copper on that could you say that again please you broke up Sorry, there uh, in, in the actual panels themselves, uh, there's not a lot of copper, but the, but the copper is used to take the uh, the power from the panels uh, to the central area. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of copper is used in uh, solar uh, solar power generation. My second question is, how much copper did China use last year? Forget about this year, last year. If anybody knows, and if their estimate is any better than their coronavirus estimates, mm -hmm. I, I actually don't know the the answer to the their copper production. Uh, they are a large consumer, and they are, uh, you know, as you start to electrify the you know the development of a of a nation, uh, there's copper is uh, becomes is the main commodity. So. I think you're going to see a lot more uh, power consum uh, a lot more copper consumption coming from from China. But I also think when you look at the uh, development of uh, India and Africa, it's, you're going to see a, uh, a massive increase. And then when you look at the use of uh, electric vehicles, uh, that's where you're going to start to really see a lot of copper usage. I, I was uh, looking at uh, some of the stats on a on a copper on a say a Tesla uh, car. The cable that runs from the battery packs in a car to the main motors on a Tesla it's only about two feet long. That that uh, copper to be able to take the the high uh, uh, flux of uh, copper or uh, electricity going that to get the power on that car. It's that uh, cable itself less than two two feet is over forty pounds of copper. Wow, and um, you talked about supply in China, but you didn't mention demand. Do you have an idea what the demand is? Uh, no, I don't. I know the I know the overall uh, demand on the uh, um, you know the globe, uh, and you saw that with uh, uh, Dick's uh, presentation, and that's increasing as uh, as we start to get more electrification electric vehicles uh, coming in so it's well over it's about two and a half to three and a half percent long term and that increases my final question is do you have does anybody uh publish an estimate of what demand is in the third world you know indonesia africa south america places like that 
Um, we don't have we don't have those figures. I think that was some of the uh, information that uh, the mercenary geologists put on the on the line. But we can we can get those for you if you like. Certainly, uh, certainly that's increasing. I've I've lived in both uh, Indonesia uh, and I've lived in Africa. Uh, and as you start to see the development of those countries, you uh, you know the electrification. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, electrification in in, uh, in Africa and in uh, say India. When you start to see that, that's where you really see the copper consumption going up. Thank Thanks, you. Alan. You're welcome. We'll turn to Murray Vanderveld. Pleased to have Murray on the line with us. I, I'm, excuse me. Sorry, I was a little late, so I, I missed part of it. But uh, Jim, could you go to your slide? Uh, wait a minute. Here, 45. Yep. Oh. I'm having. Uh, well, it's one. Yeah, that one. I'm having a little trouble. Uh, I forget which is the axis and the ordinate, but lower funding requirement percent, capex market cap. Um, can you explain what that axis is? I certainly understand higher relative value, but I, I, I don't quite understand your capital line on the left there. I, I could uh, explain it, but uh, uh, Pat would probably do a better job on that, explaining that than I would. So why don't I turn that over to you, Pat? Um, hi there. Yeah. So what it is, the x, the the, the y-axis is initial capex divided by market capitalization. So what's implied here, if you have a small capex and you have a large market cap, then you should be e you should be easy to finance it. Whereas if you've got a small uh, large market cap, sorry, if you have a large capex, so let's say you got a billion dollar project and your market cap's only you know 10 million. Uh, it's going to be virtually impossible uh, to finance the project. So in the case of Trilogy, um, you know, our, our CapEx uh, for the pre-feasibility study um, is, uh, you know, about, about uh, 800 million. And uh, our CapEx, our market cap right now is 200 million. So, okay. um, so that's what that means. And then on the other axis, it's just a P to NAV ratio. So what this is trying to show us is, you know, relative to the other projects, um, per pound, uh, Trilogy's got a, a relatively low capex, and again, that goes back to what Jim was saying: is that we got grade, and the, the greater the grade, uh, the lower the throughput you need to produce um, a, a, a pound of copper. And then, obviously, um, the other point we want to make here is, you know, you can see here with the road being permitted and the mine being permitted, uh, obviously the markets are kind of funky right now, but in a normal market. Uh, you would expect that the the shares be re-rated, and uh, that's why you know we're getting close to the road permitting, and um, and and that should be again a normal market. That should be major re-rating uh, situation. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. It was the y-axis that I was having a little trouble trying. No to worries. Figure out. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, capex divided by market cap. So. Okay, got um, it now. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's a good way to look at it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Murray. Uh, Nino, we have Nino Scalamandra. Nino, do you have a question? We'll turn to Mickey. Hi, Nino, you there? Hello? Yep, we can hear you. I can't hear, I can't hear anybody. Okay, we'll come back. We'll turn to Mickey, Mickey Fault. Um, I can answer a couple of the demand questions that were asked uh, before briefly. Uh, Chinese demand in 2018-2019 was a little less than 50% of world demand. Uh, electrical vehicle demand in the best of all projections uh, agrees with, I agree with what Jim said, uh, two to three percent increase in the next decade. If you do the math, that's about a half a million to to 750,000 tons per year 
uh, of a total demand about 25 million tons. And if you're interested in third world demand, the source of my slides, uh, the graphs is the International Copper Study Group, and they do break that demand down by continent. So you'll be able to get that. And finally, uh, uh, Jim, I have a question on the lead cons at 55%. So you're getting yes. a three percent penalty. I'm sure you've done uh, trade-off studies on that, but uh, uh, and, and you're doing that lead con really because you're trying to get the gold. But uh, what else is in that? I presume it's pyrite. And are there any other? Are there deleterious components, or is there a way to increase that con up to to what smelters prefer at 58 to 60 percent? Yeah, we've done. Uh, we're going to be doing some more work on that. That's uh, one of the advantages of having uh, getting some more test work done uh, from the core. This over the next two summers, we could do a pilot plant test at the end of this year. That's what was uh, on the books uh, to get done. Um, there, the test work that we've currently showed uh, that that's a nice average of about 55% uh, lead. There is mostly, uh, it's a pyrite as a kind of a byproduct on that. Uh, it's the lead concentrate basically is a carrier for, uh, for the precious metals. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what makes it so attractive uh, going to the, the smelters. They, they basically, they would obviously smelt the lead, but uh, what uh, really is, uh, they're interested in is the 70 ounces per ton of silver and the over an ounce of gold. Thank you. And thanks for thanks for answering those other uh, questions, uh, the demand questions. That was excellent. Appreciate it. No worries. Thank you, Mickey. Greatly appreciate it. Um, we're going to turn to Scott. Scott Edmonds has a question from the. Uh, from our audience. Yeah, somebody from the audience um, had uh, sent this question, and we appreciate that. How do you anticipate handling the waste rock, and are there any statements in the pre-feasibility studies regarding the acid generation generating potential of the stripped material? Yes, uh, I can answer both those questions. Uh, if you go back and look at the slide where you can see the uh, the development of that open pit, the waste rock uh, goes the downstream of the tailing stem so we have we have a pretty robust uh, actual design of the tailings uh, storage facility as a result of that uh, uh, and uh, it does have it is slide 28 slide 28 everybody yeah, Sorry, that's right. you can go to 28 there you go uh, you can see that uh, so the tailings facility sits back here the tailings uh, being filled, and then this is uh, all waste uh, here. It is uh, slightly acid generating, and we would have to have a water treatment plant uh, to, to uh, basically neutralize that. Uh, and we would uh, we also find that we're getting a little bit of selenium buildup, and we would have a selenium uh, current uh, analysis that uh, we've been doing so far, and it's still unfinished right now. We would probably have a, a water treatment plant, seeding plant, and at year 12, uh, about year 11 of uh, of this project. But we would we would treat the water uh, afterwards. When you when you actually look at having to set up a second tailings area uh, for the development of the boronite and and other deposits, this this tailings facility could also take some of the sunshine deposit before we'd have to set up a second tailings dam. The second tailings dam would be built back down into the main part of the valley. We've looked at a couple of different sites. Uh, the advantage of uh, that one in the future is that if it, if you included both the boronite and uh, and the VMS belts uh, tailings, the the boronite being a, a carbonate uh, hosted rock, it acts as a natural buffer for the tailings. Of, so it, uh, that's what would happen in uh, subsequent years. Any other questions, Scott? Uh, no, that's it. Okay, thanks so much. Um, you've answered everyone's questions, Jim. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you for closing remarks. Okay, I uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, dialing in and catching uh, the the updates. I think there's a couple of exciting things happening here uh, with respect to the the road. Getting that record of decision, you know, I know when I was uh, building and operating Red Dog, 
we knew about the Arctic and the Bornite deposits, uh, but uh, we we didn't have any ownership or have have uh, weren't involved with them. But we used to call them those beautiful copper deposits on the other side of the hill that are stranded assets. Uh, and I think when I look at Trilogy and with the opportunity, the road coming in from the Dalton Highway, that is uh, the magic of this, uh, the whole VMS Nambler mining belt, belt is that now you can get concentrate out to the uh, to a, a, a ice-free port. Uh, and I think that's a huge big advantage uh, for these deposits. So that's really exciting. To, we get the record decision, start working with uh, Ada to, for the development of that road. I think that bodes well for the, for somebody mentioned, it'll be more than a, a couple of generations of uh, mining for this area. And with uh, our new leadership, a very experienced uh, person and to Tony with, uh, who's very excited to take this on, I think the, I think uh, Trilogy Metal is looking looking pretty good right now. Thank you, Jim. Um, and I want to thank everyone for attending this afternoon and wish you a pleasant evening. Uh, just before we close, I might ask if uh, Tony has any closing words. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jim. Yeah, Jim, I just want to say thank you for uh, doing all the heavy lifting today on, in terms of answering the questions. I think we're in a really good position. Um, it's exciting to have a partner like South 32 in the mix. We didn't really talk very much about them, but what we have is we have the benefit of having a, uh, a very large experienced partner in the mix. And, you know, they came into this project in uh, the early part of this year after doing a lot of due diligence. So we're in a very good position where we're well funded on the project. And um, I think there's a lot of uh, exciting catalysts ahead of us. So I'm looking forward to uh, taking on the responsibility of all the good work that uh, Jim has done and Rick before him and uh, look forward to further updates in the future. Thanks very much, Tony. James, Patrick Donnelly, thank you everyone, and uh, thanks for your attendance, everyone. Have a pleasant evening. All right, take care.